Okay, uh, good evening, uh, everybody. Uh, today we are going to continue from where we stopped in our last class. And in our last class, we stopped at uh, capital allowance. And you remember, I told you that capital allowance is the allowance granted to a taxpayer in lieu of depreciation. That is, instead of charging depreciation, capital allowance will be charged to be granted rather to a taxpayer. And I remember I gave you an instance where two companies acquire the same assets and put such assets into use, into production use at the same date. And I remember I also told you that, let us assume that company A acquire an asset and put it into production use using straight line method Company B used with the balance method. And the two companies in question are also using 10% uh, depreciation rates. Now, I said at the end of the day, these two taxpayers will be charging different amount of depreciation. And tax law frown at any form of disinformacy in tax. And therefore, the company will not be granted or allow depreciation because of the lack of consistency that depreciation bring into play. Now, I will say that and I told you expectedly that we have um, some types of capital allowance. One of the types of capital allowance is the initial allowance. is the initial allowance, the annual allowance, and we could say uh, balancing allowance. Now, I also said to you that to refer from 2023 tax year, taxpayer will no longer enjoy investment allowance, except for a taxpayer that has acquired an asset prior to that uh, um, finance act implementation. Now, if a taxpayer has acquired assets in the form of a plant, equipment, and machinery in the old act, that taxpayer has rights to claim 10% of the initial cost of the assets. Okay. And I remember also we discussed what capital allowance is. I said capital allowance is an allowance granted to a taxpayer that has incurred qualifying capital expenditure and put such into production use at the end of the basis period. And we talked about the futures of capital allowance. We talked about the conditions of capital allowance in my last class with you. And we also talked about um, our treatment of asset acquired on a second hand basis. Now, I'm going to dwell on that again uh, for those of you that were not in my class in the last class. Now, we said when an asset is acquired on a second hand basis, there are two classes of assets that we're going to be looking at. The first one that we're going to be looking at is building. The first set of assets that we're going to be looking at is building. And the second set of assets we're going to be looking at is the other asset. How do you treat building acquired on second hand basis? According to the tax law, any building acquired on second hand basis, you are not going to calculate initial allowance for that asset. No initial allowance will be granted. But, however, the annual allowance to be claimed by the taxpayer shall be based on lower of the original cost of the acquisition of the asset and the new purchase price. So, this is what we are saying. If an asset, if a building cost us 10 million 10 years ago, and now it's costing us. 15 million. We are saying to claim initial allowance, annual allowance of the assets, it shall be based on the lower of original cost of acquisition of the assets and the new purchase price. So when you talk of second hand basis, that means the asset was already being used by a particular person 
before it is being transferred to another person. Now, I also said, allowance can only be claimed on building acquired or second hand building if the asset has not been previously used for the purpose of business or initial allowance has not been claimed on it before. So what we are trying to say here is that the only time you can claim initial allowance on, an, on a building dispose is when the building has not been used before now for the purpose of generating taxable income. Now, how do you treat other assets? For other assets, where other assets are acquired as a economic basis, both initial allowance and annual allowance can be claimed on it, provided that the asset in question has not been used for the purpose of generating taxable income. The assets acquired are at arm's length transaction, that is, transaction between unrelated parties. Note, however, where the transaction is between two related parties, the following shall be applicable. Number one, no initial allowance will be granted. Number two, annual allowance will be granted shall be based on the only expired useful life of the assets. Annual allowance will be granted shall be based on unexpired useful life of the assets. In my last class with you, I also remember that we talked about basis period. Uh, we talked about qualifying capital expenditure. And I told you qualifying capital expenditure are the expenditure in cure for the purpose of any income and which qualifies for granting of capital allowance. Assets, qualifying capital expenditure are the capital expenditure or assets acquired for the purpose of earning income and also qualifies for granting of capital allowance. By implication, it means that not all the assets are qualified for qualify for capital allowance. Not all the assets are qualified for capital allowance. So, and I told you some reasons why some assets may be excluded from capital allowance claim. Number one, unlimited nature of the assets such as land. Land does not have useful life. Therefore, it will not qualify for, for, capital, for capital allowance. Some asset can be subject to specific legislation which exclude them from claiming of capital allowance. For example, building use for residential purpose or assets with private use element might be limited in terms of capital allowances that can be claimed. So when you use an asset for the purpose of private facility, you use it for residential purpose, such an asset, you cannot claim capital allowance on it. And therefore, we can reasonably say that that asset does not qualify for, for, for capital allowance. So it's not going to be part of our qualified capital expenditure. Now, don't forget also that one of the conditions for granting capital allowance, we said expenditure must be incurred. Number two, the purpose of the use, utilization of the asset must be for the purpose of generating taxable income. Therefore, if an asset is not incurred for the purpose of generating taxable income, such an asset shall not qualify for capital expense, capital allowance. Public policy might also affect an asset from enjoying capital allowance. Perforator, stapler. Come, another company might say, let's uh, expense this. So it should not qualify for capital allowance. Now, I gave you examples of capital allowance, capital expenditure, which I said they are qualifying building, uh, qualifying capital, qualifying agricultural expenditure, qualifying mining expenditure, qualifying plantation, uh, qualifying plant expenditure, qualifying research and development, qualifying public transport, qualifying capital expenditure on development or acquisition of software or other capital outlay. 
on electronic application. So you are going to be reading all that yourself. And you remember we talked about our initial allowance in our last class. I said an initial allowance, an allowance granted to a taxpayer that has incurred qualified capital expenditure. And this example of this example of capital allowance is granted once throughout the useful life of the asset. That is, it's granted en bloc. You don't grant it every year. So it is granted once throughout the useful life of the asset. Now, we talked about annual allowance, where I said annual allowance, allowance granted to the taxpayer, which is going to be calculated all through the useful life of the asset. And it is passed through the useful life of the asset. That is qualifying capital expenditure, uh, annual allowance, rather. So, and in my last class with you, I gave you the formula for calculating annual allowance. I said your annual allowance, where the basis period is equal to 12 months, or where the basis period is less than 12 months. I gave you how to calculate your annual allowance. The first one is where our basis period is equal to 12 months. Our capital allowance shall be cost minus initial allowance divided by N, where there is abnormality in the first year of the business. Your capital allowance shall be cost minus initial allowance multiplied by Y over 12. What is Y? Y is the number of months in which the asset will be put into production use within the basis period. Note, I am deliberately talking about basis period. Basis period is not the same thing as your uh, financial year, year or the dates you have in your financial account. So an asset, if an asset is acquired, even if the asset is acquired on the last day of the basis period, such an asset will still enjoy a full annual allowance for the year. You will not produce it. Because our governing principle, our guiding principle here is the basis period. So, for example, in your duplication, when you are calculating your duplication, you remember you are usually take cognizance of the number of months in which your asset will be used and you pour it. Yes, we also do the same thing for capital allowance. Only that in capital allowance, basis period is what we look at. So if we acquire an asset and falls within the basis period, whether you acquire the asset on the last day of the basis period, or you acquire it on the first day of the basis period, or in between the basis period, such assets shall still qualify for full annual allowance. How do you calculate your, your N? How do you calculate N? You remember I said, Cost minus initial allowance divided by N. N is the number of years. And you calculate your N by saying 100% by annual allowance rates. Now, for the purpose of capital allowance, because of the disuniformity we had during the regime of depreciation, capital allowance was introduced. And in introducing capital allowance, it's now categorized all the assets into various categories and on which we now have a standard rates in which the taxpayer can use to claim their capital allowance. I showed you the rates in my last class. This is the rates. So we have for company and we have for individual. Now, when a company incurs qualifying capital expenditure on building, the company shall be granted 15% initial allowance on costs. So imagine the cost is 10 million. 15% of 10 million is 1.5 million. So that is the initial allowance that the taxpayer will be granted. The annual allowance shall be 10% of the cost by non initial allowance by, by number of years. So how do we ascertain the number of years? Your number of years is equal to 100% divided by annual allowance rates. In this regard, land and building has 10 years, 10 uh, percent. The rate that we're going to use is given to us as 10 percent. So in calculating the number of useful life of building, is going to be 100 percent divided by 10. 
which is going to be 10 years. By implication, the building will use 10 years within the build, within the company. And we are going to claim capital out for the next 10 years of building. Now, if it is furniture and fixing, that is five years. Five years, that is 20% annual and 25% initial. If it is motorbike, it is going to be um if it is motorbike, it is going to be four years for or uh, annual allowance that the asset that is hundred percent divided by four. That is that. Yes, I have a question, sir. Go ahead. So when you, you mentioned about um building acquired on second hand basis, the treatment, right? I didn't really um understand the difference between the building and then the other assets. So building has a peculiarity. The peculiarity of building is that if it is acquired on second hand basis, we will not calculate initial allowance for it. But the annual allowance to be calculated shall be on the lower of the original cost of the asset and the new purchase price. Do you understand me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So imagine when the asset was bought initially, the value of the assets was 10 million. And when you bought the asset, buy the asset now, the amount you bought the asset for, the new price now is 15 million. We are saying to calculate annual allowance, it's going to be the lower of the two. Okay. Now for All the right. purpose of this class, thank you. For the purpose of this class, we are going to be less concerned about this other table because this is for personal income tax and we are not doing personal income tax here. So let's quickly go to basis period for capital allowance. Basis period for capital allowance. Now you remember when we talked about basis period, we said basis period, basis period of uh, determines the uh is it's it is it is actually used for the purpose of determining the profit that the taxpayer will pay in a particular year. That is, without basis period, you will not be able to determine a divine period in which the taxpayer will be assessed with tax. The same thing for capital allowance. Capital allowance also have similarity with that. Basis period for capital allowance is used for the purpose of introducing or allocating the asset to the relevant year in which we are going to introduce the asset for the purpose of capital allowance computation. Now, take for example, let's look at this illustration. This is on an individual basis. So we said Jessica Venture is a sole proprietor, commence business on 1-4-2015, and prepare account to 30 6 to annually. The following assets are required by the company on the date shown below. Are acquired. Acquired by the company on the date shown below. We have 1, 2, 5, 15, 1, 10, 15, 10, 8, 16. So we acquire three assets. So the examiner is now asking us, how do you assess qualifying capital expenditure acquired prior to the date of commencement? Any qualifying capital, I hope you are right. Too. Any qualifying capital expenditure acquired prior to the date of commencement will be deemed to have been acquired on the date of commencement. I'll say it again. Any qualifying capital expenditure acquired prior to the date of commencement shall be deemed to have been acquired on the date of commencement. Okay? So that is the treatment. 
the examiner in this scenario also asks us to prepare asset allocation schedule from 2016 to 2020 year of assessment. Don't forget that this question is on commencement basis. Look at it. Commencement basis. Commence business on 1 for 2015. So, and I'm very sure every one of us on this bridge remembers commencement rule. What is commencement rule? We told you that we have three years that is statutory, that are statutory. The first year is the first year of uh, commencement. And we said that will be assessed the tax from the date of commencement to the end of the first accounting year. End. Second year will be from a day minute after the end of the first accounting year end to the end of the second accounting year end. Third year will be assessed to tax from a day immediately after the end of the second accounting year end to the end of the third accounting year end. That is the principle. And fourth and subsequent years will be on preceding year basis. We have talked about this before. So on that note, that is what we are going to also use in computing our capital allowance, okay? Now, but before that, we need to also prepare an asset allocation schedule where we're going to allocate the asset to the relevant year. And in doing that, our basis period uh, must be very sound. Now, you remember this company commenced operation when? 1 4 2015. So, and the accounting year of this company is 36 annually. That means in my first year of commencement, I will say my base period shall be from the date of commencement 1 4 0 15 to 30 0 15 to 15. You remember from the date of commencement to the end of the first accounting year end. The second tax year will be from a day immediately after the end of the first accounting year end, which is 1 7 2015 to the end of the second accounting year end, 30 6 2016. The next one will be 1 7 2016, that is a day immediately after the end of the Second accounting year will be 1716 to 30 years, 6, 2017. Fourth and subsequent years will be on preceding year basis. Now, if after you have written your basis period like this, after you've written your basis period like this, the next thing you need to do is to now begin to allocate the assets to the relevant year. Don't forget, we said any assets acquired prior to the date of commencement shall be deemed to have been uh, uh, incurred and put into production use on the date of commencement. Therefore, even though this motor vehicle was acquired before this date, it will be deemed to have been acquired on the date the company commenced. Therefore, I'm introducing that here. The next one is plant and machinery. Plant and machinery was acquired 110, 2015, right? So if I come back to my table here, where will it fall here? Will it fall in the first one, 110, 2015, or it will fall here? It will fall in this period. One. Yes, 110, 2015 is within this period. All right. The next one, Arab money, I greet you. You are welcome. I greet you, sir. Well done. So the next one is the third tax year. In the third tax year, it is going to be a day immediately after the end of this second accounting year end to the end of the third accounting year end. Now let's look at the asset acquired again. An asset that was acquired 10 8 2016, where will it fall? It will fall within this period. 10 8 2016 is within this one. So that is how to allocate asset to the relevant year. <laughs> now, having allocated the asset to the relevant years, we will now move forward to the next thing that we need to do, which is the computation of our capital allowance. Because this 
person is an individual, then we are going to use individual rates in calculating our annual allowance and initial allowance. You remember. So the first thing that you need to do, the examiner said we should compute the capital allowance for 2016-2021 year of assessment. So this is what I will do. I will write the rates, initial allowance and annual allowance. Motorbike rates, I will go to my table. Examiner will give you this table. Don't cram it. They will give you. So motorbike, if you acquire motorbike, she is. Motorbike initial allowance is 25. And for annual is 20. The reason why we are using this table is because this question was on individual. Look at it, Jessica. Ordinarily, for this year class, it is complete that we are going to be dwelling more than, than the individual. But I just want to use that individual as an example because it's easier for, it's going to be easy for us to understand. Okay. So I'll do my uh, rates, which is 25, as we've seen the other time, and 20. This is 20 and 10. This is 15 and 10. So in the first year, 1 million was in cure to acquire motor life. And don't forget, we have said, if your basis period is not up to 12 months, you are going to operate the basis period. Now, in this regard, this basis period is not up to 12 months. And why is it not up to 12 months? It's because the company is just commencing operation. And that is why it's not up to 12 months. And we're not going to say, I'll count from April, May, June. That is three over 12. Multiply. So, you know, we've gotten this to be, to get our initial allowance, we've gotten that, which is 25% of cost. What I'm explaining now is how we got this annual allowance. So that will be, 1 million minus 250 divided by how many years is this asset supposed to use? Five years divided by five. But because this asset is not used the full months, sorry, the full months in this year, we are going to operate the annual allowance. Remember the characteristics. Annual allowance is related to the number of months in which the asset will be put to production use within the basis period. Meanwhile, initial allowance is not same. You don't do that for initial allowance. For an initial allowance, all you just do is to calculate it straight on cost. And that is what we have done. So let me show you what we've done here. So look at it. We said 1 million minus 250 divided by 5. We know that the asset will use 5 years. Multiply by 3 over 12, we will get, we get this value. We can see the value here. And this last column here, shall represent my capital allowance column. So if I have capital allowance in this second period and in this top period, I will just add the three together and bring it here. But for this question, in this question, we don't have some of something of such. So that is why whatever you have here, you just bring it here, you tally it. The next one is our tax within down value. What is tax now value? I hope you are right. Tax now value is the excess of cost over revenue and over the expenditure. Tax now value is the excess of the cost. Sorry, I'm taking the first thing I said back. Is the answer of the cost of the asset minus the initial allowance and annual allowance, as the case may be. So what we have done here is to get our tax return value. That is one million minus two fifty minus three seventy five. You will get your tax return value. Now in the second year, if you look at our table here, you will notice that plant and machinery was also acquired. Plant and machinery was acquired. So because the plant and machinery was acquired, I am going to also say in the second year, I'll bring it in. Note again that this plant and machinery, even though the date of acquisition is 110, 2015, if you if you look at it very well, 
ordinarily in the accounting period, this plant and machinery would have used about five months or seven months before we calculate our when we are calculating our depreciation on it, we would have said we pray it to seven months. But under capital allowance, in as much as this date falls within your basis period, the assets we enjoy full annual allowance. I don't know if you have done income tax with Mr. Uh, uh, what was his name? Mr. Uh, Mr. Kazim. Yeah, in that income tax, they will be teaching you why depreciation is different from capital allowance. They will be telling you what's usually called deferred tax. Okay, they will, talk, they will teach you deferred tax. So one of the reasons why depreciation and capital allowance are not always giving the same answer is because of the principle I've just explained now. Now, because we have just acquired furniture and fitting, sorry, plant and machinery, on this new acquisition, I am going to calculate initial allowance, which is 320,000. And I also calculate annual allowance, that is 160,000 minus 320 divided by 20, divided by five. Look at it. 160,000, where is it? I can't find it. Okay. But we know what was, was calculated. So it is for plant and machinery. Oh, okay. It's Eden. For plant and machinery, is here, actually, but it is it's Eden. It is going to be the cost which is this cost price 1.6 million minus 320. What is the initial allowance rate? 10. Sorry, annual allowance rate is 10%. So I'll say this minus the divided by 10, 10, 10 years. I'm going to have 128,000, which is this. Also, for motorbike that was acquired. Proud so now we need to go and recalculate the annual allowance and ignore the operation because in that second year the assets will enjoy full capital allowance. Therefore, I'm going to recompose the capital allowance by saying one million minus two fifty divided by five will give you one fifty thousand, and that is one fifty thousand you saw here. This one. So one. So I'll get my tax return value again, which is the tax return value I have here minus annual allowance. In this situation, this is the first time of use of this asset. It should be tax return value, the cost minus initial allowance minus annual allowance. They give us our tax return down value of this value and this value for this year. We just acquired additional expenditure in form of furniture and fitting. For furniture and fitting, the initial allowance rate is 15%. So 15% of 360, 3.6 million, we have 540. So on that, we also need to calculate our annual allowance. Our annual allowance shall be 360, minus 3.6 million minus 540, whatever you have, divided by what is the annual allowance rate, 10%, that is divided by 10 years. You will get your answer. And that process, we will continue to follow it till the last year of use. Now, in the last year of use of this asset, ordinarily, a motorbike is supposed to use five years, that is one, two, three, for five. In the last year of use, you must retain 10 Naira. I'll say it again. In the last year of use, you must retain 10 Naira. And that 10 Naira is what we are going to use to compare with our disposal when 
the time arrives for us to dispose our assets. When you notice what we have had here, you will notice the same constant pattern for annual allowance. Annual allowance I will charge in the first year, so I will charge the second year, third year, fourth year, fifth year. Do you understand me? Okay, but when you look at the annual allowance here, in the second and the third year, we have a constant pattern, which is 150, 150. You know how good that 150, 150. But in the, this is the last year of use of this asset. In the last year of use, our annual allowance shall be equal to our tax return value minus 10 error. So this is our annual allowance. We said it shall be equal to the tax return value. And you just remove 10 error and you have 10 error. But when you look at every other one, because we have not gone to the last year of use, we we'll continue to carry the annual allowance forward. Annual allowance. You'll be deducting it from the tax return value every year. Any question at this point? Okay, in the absence of none, we we'll go to disposal of qualifying capital expenditure. This class today we end by 9.30. Please bear with me. I am tired. But hopefully by next week, by the grace of God, I will cover up. Okay. So disposal of qualifying capital expenditure. A qualifying capital expenditure is deemed to be disposed when relevant interest is sold. When you have sold your interests, when you are no longer the owner then we say the asset is not going to be within our domain again. Or where the company itself, um, the lease hold on the asset has expired. Concession has expired. Especially for oil and gas company, where they usually have like 20 years for their licenses. If the license has now expired, that means the company, their assets is deemed disposed. Basically, you are going to be reading all this yourself. Basically, we have the consequence of our disposal will be that it's either a company, the company made profit on disposal, or the company made loss on disposal. When the company makes profit on disposal, we say the company has balance in charge. I'll say it again. When the company makes profit on disposal of fixed assets, we will say the company has what we call balance in charge. But when the company makes loss on disposal, we will say the company has balancing allowance. Mm -hmm. How do you calculate balancing charge? Your balancing charge shall be the excess of your sales process over the tax return value at disposal. Excess of the mm -hmm. sales proceed over the tax return value at disposal. That is, your sales proceed minus tax return down value. The next one is balancing allowance. Balancing allowance will occur where your sales proceed is less than the uh, tax return value at disposal. Your sales proceed is less than tax return value at disposal. That is that. Now, how do you treat balancing charge when it occurs? Balancing charge shall not be more than the total allowance claimed on the asset disposed. Balancing charge shall not be more than the total allowance claimed on the asset disposed. So if you dispose an asset and balancing charge arises, it shall not be more than the total allowance claimed on the asset. You remember what we mean by balancing charge? We said balancing charge is when your sales proceed exceed your tax return value at disposal. So what we're not trying to say here is that your balancing charge shall be restricted to the total allowance the company claimed on the assets disposed. 
Now, if that is the case, we move on to illustration. Illustration. Okay. Look at this illustration. An asset has a tax value of 900,000. Capital allowance, both initial allowance and annual allowance of 233,333. And the sales proceeds of 1,250,000. Of one million two fifty. Now you are required to compute balancing charge. You remember I told you balancing charge will be sales proceed less tax income value at the close. So we have balancing charge of three fifty. Do you understand this? Balancing charge of three fifty. Now. If that is the case, we also said that your balancing charge shall not be more than total allowance claimed on the assets. Now, how much is the total allowance claimed on these assets? 233,000. How much is the balancing charge that we calculated? 350,000. Therefore, balancing charge shall be restricted to the total allowance claimed on the assets. Because balancing charge is subject to income tax of the company. So, Company usually charges as added as back part of their income, which is going to generate of tax. So, how do you ascertain the cost of acquisition? That is the total cost, less than the number of disposal, you get total claim on the assets. Let's look at the next one. The following information related to the asset schedule of Alice and Year Limited. Sales proceeds, 10 million. Cost of acquisition, 7.5. Tax number, at down value at disposal, you have 3 million. Compute the balancing charge. So our balancing charge shall be 10 million minus tax number value at disposal, which is 7 million. So we now said, again, we want to be sure of, look at what we have as balancing charge, 7 million. But we cannot be so sure that this 7 million will be subject to income tax. We need to go and check to compute the cost of acquisition. How much do we buy this asset? To get a cost of acquisition, it's going to be the total cost Less tax income value, you will get the allowance claim on the as assets. You remember, we said your balancing charge shall not be more than total allowance claim on the assets. So, how do we get the allowance claim on the assets? By us saying the total cost of the assets, less tax income value at disposal, you will get your total cost of the assets. Again, from my explanation to you, our balancing charge cannot be more than total allowance claimed on the asset. Therefore, we will restrict the assets to the total allowance claim on the asset. That is, balancing charge shall be restricted to 4.5 million. Let's go straight to balancing allowance. Balancing allowance will occur in a situation where your sales proceed is less than the tax income value at disposal. It should be noted that balancing allowance is an additional allowance. It's an additional allowance. You don't uh, restrict it. So the company can claim as much as capital allowance, balance allowance they want because there is no restriction to balancing allowance. So look at this example. We said, assuming an asset has a tax value of 1.9 million, 
capital allowance, both initial allowance and annual allowance on the QC is 233 million and sales proceed is um 2 million, 1.2 million. Now you remember we said when your sales proceed is less than tax return value, you have balancing allowance. And when you look at what we have here, it is balancing allowance. And what we said the other time is that balancing allowance is an additional allowance. There is no restriction to balancing allowance. Let's look at this one. The following information relates to the asset schedule of Mega 99 Nigeria Limited. Sales proceed 1.5, cost of action 10 million, and uh, target number at, at disposal 3 million, 750. Convert the balancing allowance and explain the balance, the effect of this on company's profits. Okay. So the balancing allowance, you remember, sales proceed, less target number value at disposal. You have two million two hundred and fifty. Just like I told you, there is no restriction to the allowance claim by the taxpayer. Therefore, when the taxpayer wants to claim its allowance, taxpayer will claim total allowance on the assets. It will also take sales proceed, and we also take balancing allowance. Let's see it. From this, my explanation. Total allowance claim on the asset, we know how to calculate that, which is total cost of action less tax in value at disposal. I will give you this. If you add these two together, you have 8.5 million. And don't forget that we said. When a taxpayer incurs qualifying capital expenditure and they have balancing allowance, okay, the balancing allowance shall constitute additional allowance in the order of the taxpayer. So let's look at it. From the foregoing computation, the taxpayer will claim 6.5 million as initial allowance and annual allowance, and also claim. Two point uh, two fifty as an as annual allowance as balancing charge balancing allowance by implication the total allowance claimed will be made available for relief against the profits as a result of the loss made the one point five million will also be exempted from income tax. Do you understand me? When a company makes loss on disposal, the company will exempt them. Now, look at it. How did we know that this company makes loss on, a, on disposal? This company acquired this asset 10 million and disposed such assets for 1.5 million. That means the company had lost value, okay, in terms of the asset disposal. So they dispose the asset for 1.5. But they acquired 10 million. That means they have a loss of how much? One point, uh, a loss of about 8.5 million. Because the taxpayer will also be exempted from loss, capital loss, such taxpayer will enjoy 100% relief. We will enjoy 100% relief. That is sales proceed will be part of the relief. Capital allowance will be part of relief. Balancing charge will be part of relief. And when you look at it holistically, you notice that we have even gone back to that our 10 million naira costs of the assets. So by implication, the taxpayer will be exempted all the costs of the assets when they are rebalancing allowance. Do you have any question at this point? So this this um exemption is not really clear. This last um illustration. So the only exemption that this company has is 8.5 million. How did I get 8.5 million? You remember the taxpayer already have 
if you take 10 million from this, you will have 6 million 250. Abby? Because you remember, we want to get the tax, we want to get the total allowance claimed on the assets before now. Abby, to get total allowance claimed on the asset will be total cost of the acquisition less tax now value at disposal. And that will give us 6.350. Now, again, our principle for calculating balancing allowance will be total sales minus tax now value at disposal. If that is the case, we have 2.250. I had the two together. I've explained this one. I've explained this one. I had to six million two fifty together plus to two million two fifty. So we have two point eight point five. Again, we said knowing fully well that a company is exempted from capital loss when they make loss when they dispose of assets. Such is exempted from tax. Therefore. This taxpayer would also enjoy a benefit of the sales proceed because the sales proceed would not be taxed because they are made loss. Therefore, the entire value will be exempted from tax. That is, the ten million will be exempted from tax. Okay, that is that. Let's quickly rush through this. I'm just going to introduce you to this, and we we'll end the class. Mm -hmm. It is also possible that a company acquires an asset and create capital allowance on the assets. It is also possible that the company, in the process of claiming capital allowance, they cease operation and by adventure they are unable to claim the capital allowance fully. The tax authority gives the taxpayer right upon cessation to carry back all their capital allowance for a maximum period of five years before the year of cessation. So what we are trying to say here is that if, if the capital, if the taxpayer cannot fully recover its capital allowance and the company assists, the taxpayer has right to carry back all the only cool capital allowance against its profits for a maximum period of five years. Okay? So that is that. Do you have any question? Do you have any question? In the absence of no question, we'll be coming up the class. I am going to be the one to teach you Saturday by the grace of God. So uh, we're going to imagine you with um, our students on uh, the weekday on uh, the weekend lectures because we are not going to have weekend lecture this coming Saturday. And the only reason being that uh there's going to be marathon in Lagos and it's going to affect our operation. So they are also going to be joining our class on Saturday by the grace of God. So that will be it for today. See you on Saturday by the grace of God. Good night, guys. Can we get the material? I forwarded this to the WhatsApp group. Pick it okay. up from there. All right. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you, sir, for the night. Thank you, guys. Bye. Judith, thank you. I can see your hand. Good night.